Hello and welcome everyone. We are gonna get started in about another minute. We're gonna give people a couple seconds just to finish logging in. The number of attendees is jumping up. Excited to have everyone today. Just gonna give it another minute. Just a quick note, if you are attending the webinar on your phone, you may not be able to see the webcam, the video of myself um, or Kate, uh, but it will be available in the recording that will be shared after the webinar wraps up. Okay, let's get started. So welcome everyone to another Fairfax Cryobank webinar. Today we're gonna to be covering donor sperm and talking about in-office IUIs as well as home inseminations. This webinar is being recorded and the link to the video will be shared with all of the registered participants. And as I was saying before, if you're attending on your phone, um, you may not be able to see the video of myself or Kate, but the video uh, will be available as part of the recording. So today, here we go. Our speakers today are Kate Wisda, who is a nurse practitioner. She is a women's health nurse practitioner for our Pacific Reproductive Services Clinic in Pasadena. I am Michelle Audi, I'm the lab director and director of operations for Fairfax Cryobank, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit briefly about donor sperm before we get into the good stuff with Kate. Um, and then we're gonna have Christy Burke on for the Q&A session. She'll, she is our Director of Client Services. She'll be able to answer any of your questions related to client services. And of course, we have Morgan Barker, our Senior Marketing Manager, who's gonna moderate the Q&A session of the, um, of the webinar. So I always like to get started on a webinar by setting some goals, keeps us accountable, keeps us all on the same page. First, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of donor sperm options. Then I'm gonna pass things over to Kate. She is gonna do a review of home insums and then a review of in-office intrauterine insums. And then we're gonna do a great Q&A session to answer your questions. So just to get started, to make sure that we're all starting on an even playing field, I wanna go over a little bit of terminology for you. Um, we'll be referring to ART, which can either be artificial or assisted reproductive techniques. ICI, which is intracervical insemination, IUI, which is intrauterine insemination. We'll talk about home insem, and when we talk about home insems, we're talking about ICIs. You should only be performing an ICI in the comfort of your own home, and IUI is a medical procedure that should be done with a medical professional. So just to get started, when you are working with Fairfax Cryobank, you're actually working with three high-quality donor brands. Fairfax Cryobank uh, has been around since 1986. We are the trusted choice for donor sperm. Over the years, we have partnered with and acquired two additional sperm banks, CLI or Cryogenic Laboratories and Pacific Reproductive Services. So when you're searching for a donor on our donor search, you may see any of those three brands. You can trust the quality of all three of them. What's relevant for this conversation today, for this webinar today and this topic, is specifically the specimen type. That's one of the most frequently asked questions that we get. So I just want to briefly cover the specimen types that you can purchase for these procedures that we're going to talk about. Just as a quick uh, tip, I'm going to click here and hopefully show you. We have this great infographic. I hope you all are able to see this. Um, great infographic on our website under specimen information of how can I use my vial type. And it has a little key here. It goes through and you can search by your procedure and it'll tell you what you need to purchase. So again, this is just under Fairfax Cryobank specimen information. If you go to resources, it's right here under the specimen information. So that's a great tool um, that you can use. So just to review what those prep types are. An ICI prep intracervical insemination prep type. This is a standard sample. 
it hasn't been washed. It basically is the, the sperm sample, fresh evaluation is completed, and then we add a freeze media with a cryoprotectant that helps the cells survive that freeze cell process, and you're gonna get at least 10 million total motile sperm in that vial. Um, this can be used for an at-home insemination, or if this is all that's available when you go to purchase, if your clinic can wash the sample, you could purchase this for an in-office IUI. But if you're going to do an IUI, you're better off going straight ahead and purchasing the IUI prep. This is an intrauterine insemination prep vial. What this means is that the seminal fluid has been washed away and you're basically getting the sperm, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in a freeze media. So in this one, you're also getting 10 million total modal cells at a minimum, probably gonna get a little more, um, and that's ready to go. If you're gonna have an IUI, if you have an IUI scheduled with Kate on Tuesday, the sample's gonna get there you know, the Friday before, and they're gonna be able to just thaw it out right away and put it into the syringe and catheter and do that I IUI. Um, as I said, if your donor doesn't have IUI prep available, you can purchase an ICI if your clinic or practitioner is able to do the wash to remove the seminal fluid. That has to be removed because seminal fluid has proteins and hormones in it that if they're inserted into the uterus can cause some cramping and problems. And then lastly, um, we sell ART or um, IVF prep vials. These can be either ICI or IUI, meaning they're washed or unwashed but they're, they're gonna have fewer sperm in them. They're gonna have at least 6 million total modal. And the reason we do this is because if, you're, if you know that you're gonna have IVF or ICSI, for example, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, it takes far fewer cells to achieve fertilization in those ART procedures than it does in an insemination. So we offer the ART prep types um, at a lower cost point. Um, the other thing to note is if your donor doesn't have IUI or ICI available, but you still wanna use that donor, you can combine two art vials to do either an at-home or an in-office insemination. So now it's just about finding the right donor. So you're gonna have a ton of donors to choose from. We have over 450 donors available on our website. You're gonna choose your donor, work with our client services team to purchase. If you do want to consider having full siblings for your child in the future, you might, and you have the means, you might wanna purchase a couple of extra vials. We do have a store with Fairfax Cryobank, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, process in place where if you do store with us and end up not needing the vials, you can always sell them back for a partial refund. If there are questions about that, we can do that at the end. And our client services staff is ready and able to help you through the process. So the second really relevant question that comes up when we talk about inseminations is, do I actually need to work with a medical provider? And the short answer is yes. We're always gonna recommend that you work with a medical provider, a medical health professional, a, a physician, a gynecologist, a nurse practitioner, a midwife, somebody that's going to help you prep your body for pregnancy. Um, we are gonna recommend that everybody speaks to a medical professional just about their overall health and wellness. The, they're going to help you prep your body. They're going to give you recommendations if, in case you may need to have fertility testing um, and make recommendations on what to purchase in terms of what procedure you should have. And it really is always best to ensure your readiness, the readiness of your body for pregnancy before you invest, especially in the home insemination process. So short answer, yes, work with a medical professional for their advice. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Kate. As I mentioned, Kate is a nurse practitioner in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our Pasadena location. And she is gonna go through, I'm gonna change it over to her now. She is gonna go through and talk to you about home enzymes and in-office enzymes. All for Can you, you see me okay? Yes, you look great. Okay. Great. So my name is Kate, I'm a women's health nurse practitioner. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the details of uh, intrauterine insemination and intracervical insemination, or we also know it as in-home insemination. Uh, so just going off of Michelle's slide, do I need to work with a medical provider? Uh, the answer is, is yes. Uh, definitely meet with your provider before you decide to get pregnant. Uh, let them know that you're deciding to get pregnant, that you want to get pregnant. What can you do to be your most, most healthiest before you try? Um, make sure that your doctor 
is able to do a full assessment for you. And um, if you want to, you can even have your OBGYN do the assessment. You can call them and ask for a preconception assessment. So preconception assessment, and they'll, um, they'll be more than happy to help. Okay, so going on to in insemination at home and in office. Is home insemination right for you? I apologize, I'm having some technical difficulties. Okay, is home insemination right for you? Uh, the answer is yes, if you are free of fertility issues. Again, meeting with your medical provider will help you determine if you have any fertility issues or fertility concerns. Anyone over the age of 35 should uh, ask their doctor to check their fertility. Uh, your primary care might not be knowledgeable in that, but your OBGYN will definitely know how to handle that for you. Um, yes, if you're comfortable with the idea of performing the procedure in your home, hopefully this webinar today will help you feel more comfortable. I think most people, uh, once they know the ins and outs of it, will feel, feel comfortable performing the procedure in their own home. Um, you've discussed family building with a medical provider, and if it is acceptable under the laws of your state, uh, just feel free to call our client services. The number is listed, and they can help you work through that. Your home delivery. So required forms prior to ordering. There's a home delivery authorization that you need to fill out. Contact client services again at that number and they'll make sure that it's okay in your state. You'll receive a box with a shipping tank that contains your sperm sample, paperwork, and a needleless syringe. And we'll go over that in detail later in the slides. Why try home insemination? Often couples are told to try at home for several months when they want to start their family. Home inseminations, also called intracervical inseminations or ICI, allows individuals and couples without a sperm providing partner to try at home before moving to in-office procedures. Getting started. The person being inseminated must track their menstrual cycle and ovulation. Uh, so first off, we need to know how long your cycles are. A cycle would be from the first day of your period to the next day, the next first day of your period. So we're looking at 28, 30 days on average, though some women are 27, some women are 35. If you're finding a huge variance in the length of your cycle, such as seven plus days, then it might be worth mentioning that to your provider and um, making sure that everything's okay. Um, we recommend at our clinic that you start monitoring your cycles. Uh, you can use one of those free apps on your phone, or you can even just mark it on a calendar. It's whatever works best for you, but definitely get a couple months under your belt where you know how long your cycle is. That will help you use an ovulation predictor kit. So commercially available ovulation kits help to determine your fertility window. Uh, I have a, an example of one right here. You can get it at uh, any drugstore. Uh, it'll come out, it'll look just like a pregnancy test. Let's see. So this is the stick. It looks a lot like a pregnancy test. You pee on this side, and then you have your window here. Um, it looks, we recommend the ones that look kind of like an old school litmus test and that there's two lines. Uh, the ones that are digital, or the ones that cost $300 and there's an app on your phone, it is uh, less suited for our purposes. We wanna know when you have something called an LH surge or a luteinizing hormone surge. So we know that when your luteinizing hormone spikes, that 24 hours later, you're going to ovulate. So this is going to test when you have that LH surge. Um, some women might have low levels of LH before they get to the LH surge. And the really nice tests, the ones that cost $300, are going to let you know for days ahead of time when you have that small amount of LH surge. But you won't be inseminating days before ovulation. You'll only be inseminating on ovulation day. So again, we recommend the ones that have the old school litmus test. 
So you'll have one control line that's always there. After you pee on the stick, 10, 15 minutes later, you'll have your own line. Uh, once you get that line as dark as or darker than the control line, then you know that you're ovulating. Uh, fertility window, you're most fertile for a 12 to 24 hour window. That's when you ovulate, typically between days 11, 15 of the menstrual cycle. This is unique to everyone. Best to monitor your cycle for several months to establish your regularity. We talked about that. You can actually practice with these um, so you know what you're, what you're going to see when you ovulate. Your medical provider can answer questions about this. What do I need to do? What do I need to do a home insemination? First, you need a comfortable space where you feel safe. A lot of our patients like to use their bedroom. Um, some people use the sofa. It's whatever you feel most comfortable with. Uh, we will provide for you a needleless syringe, and we're going to play with this in a minute. Uh, with this, for example, there will be some paperwork instructions. And we'll, we'll need you to get some insulated gloves because you'll be opening up the tank. Uh, and then eye protection as well. Prepare the space in yourself. It is important to have a comfortable, safe space. You can see there's a picture here of a bed covered in throw pillows and a woman meditating. So you wanna find a peaceful space. You wanna find a, a space that you're very comfortable in. Ideally, you will be reclining on your back with pelvis tilted for up to two hours. We recommend that you flip from side to side every 20 minutes, um, 30 minutes. You can have some soothing music, candles, anything that helps you relax. Place yourself in a positive frame of mind, focus on relaxation. I always recommend that my patients yoga breathe, which is breathing as deeply as you can and even doing your square breathing which is, you know, I don't know, anywhere from four to seven counts in, hold for four counts, and then breathe out for four to seven. Um, meditate if that appeals to you and breathe mindfully. Breathing deeply will help relax your pelvic muscles. <clears throat> Intracervical insemination. Gather everything needed and place on a solid surface. So this is actually a nursing uh, trick. When you are going to do a procedure, you make sure that you have everything in front of you first. So you get a table or a bed, a bedside table. You're going to set everything out that you could possibly need so you're ready. Uh, you're going to open the needleless syringe. So it comes in this wrapper. It's a sterile needleless syringe. You're going to open your wrapper and take out the syringe. Another nursing trick is to sort of uh, play with the plunger. The plunger likes to get stuck. So before you put it in your vial, just kind of push the plunger in and out, in and out. And you can see it's moving very smoothly. So open the needle syringe, leaving it in the wrapper. You'll put it back in the wrapper. The sperm vial thawed per the instructions from the cryobank. So what you'll do is you'll remove the lid of the tank. You can see a picture over there. It's on my right side. Uh, wearing gloves. You're gonna carefully remove the cane holding the vial. Remove the vial from the cane and verify the donor number. It's a little difficult to see, mine says one, two, three. Your paperwork will have the donor number. You can find one, two, three and your name on the paperwork to make sure it's the correct vial. Wrap the vial in a cloth or a paper towel to dry off any condensation. Leave at room temperature for 15 to 20 minutes to allow the sample to thaw. So in order to determine if it's thawed or not, you can just invert it carefully. And you'll be able to see if it's one solid mass or if it's now sort of a thick liquid. Uh, the person doing the insemination, which it can be yourself or can be your partner, will wash their hands thoroughly. The person being inseminated will lay on their back with their hip elevated. You can use a cushion to support the back. Um, I particularly like the cushion under the buttocks. And then you can bend your knees so that your hips are tilted upward. Um, and that way, if you need to sort of put your knees outward or inward, you're able to do that. Pick up and gently mix the sperm vial. Again, you're going to invert it. Allow the volume to settle to the bottom. Once you see that it's settled at the bottom, you're going to take the sperm out. 
So you'll take your syringe out of the packaging. And again, you'll notice there's no needle here, none at all. It's just the barrel. You'll open up your vial. You'll pull the plunger out to make space in the barrel, insert it into the vial, and pull up. Okay. If you want to remove some of the air, you're welcome to. I would leave a small air bubble in there um, so that you don't lose any of the sperm. You'll actually see that there's a very small amount of sperm, sperm in the vial, but there is a count of roughly 10 million. So you don't want to lose any of that liquid. You or your partner will carefully open the sperm vial by unscrewing the cap like we did, slowly and carefully draw the sample up into the needleless syringe. Place the syringe into the vagina as far as it will go, with the tip close to but not touching the cervix. So for a lot of women, this might sound tricky. I promise it's not. If you can insert the syringe up to here, if you can insert until it stops, even if it doesn't go all the way up to here, then you're hitting the cervix. If you go straight back, you're hitting the cervix. So it's, it's really not that complicated or as complicated as it sounds or as complicated as this picture looks. Um, gently expel the sperm sample onto the cervix. That means you push in the plunger, remove the syringe and relax. Remain lying comfortably for at least 30 minutes up to two hours. Shift your position from abdomen to back every 20 minutes. I really like this um, last part where it says to shift your position from abdomen to your back every 20 minutes. What is going to be happening is that the cervix is going to get washed. The cervix is like a circle. It's going to get washed with the sperm and then the sperm will settle below the cervix. But if you flip over, that sperm is going to wash the cervix again, flip over again, and it washes it again. So every time that sperm crosses the opening of the cervix, it allows the sperm to get into the uterus get into the cervix easier, more easily. Post intracervical insemination, some individuals will use a soft cup placed at the cervix after the sperm is expelled. It's not necessary, but some find it helpful. Remaining reclined allows the sperm to swim through the cervix and into the uterus up to the egg. Some individuals choose to do multiple inseminations during the fertile window in one cycle. Uh, speak to your medical provider about this option if you have questions. So the soft cup, you can actually, uh, you can find online, you can find at drugstores, just Google soft cup, and you should be able to purchase that pretty easily. What is the cost of home insemination? So the cost includes uh, the cost of the donor sperm, uh, shipping and handling. Uh, you're also gonna spend uh, anywhere from 20 to $30 on an OPK kit, an ovulation predictor kit. And Fairfax will provide written instructions for thawing the sperm sample and for ICI along with the needleless syringe. So this syringe will come with it. And of course, the vial, which will actually have the cap on it. Success rate for ICI or in-home insemination. If you have no fertility issues or concerns, it's up to 10% success rate per cycle, each cycle being each menstrual cycle. Um, so roughly it's every month that you try, you have about a 10% success rate. If you can take several insemination attempts, it can take several attempt, insemination attempts to achieve pregnancy. We usually recommend three to six tries. If you are not pregnant after several home attempts, it is best to speak with your medical professional about having a fertility assessment. Uh, but again, we recommend fertility assessment at the beginning, especially if you're over the age of 35. So next we're gonna talk about intrauterine insemination. We also call it IUI. So an IUI will actually bypass the vaginal canal and the cervix and enter directly into the uterus. So instead of depositing the sperm directly into the vagina, we go through the cervix into the uterus and deposit it there. So the sperm only has to swim into the tubes in order to get to the egg and inseminate the egg. Uh, why try intrauterine insemination if you're not particularly comfortable with the ICI procedure? Um, we also have higher success rates. So, um, if you have a reduced fertility or you're over the age of 35, 
Um, ovulation predictor kits often don't work for a lot of people. So if you have any complications, this would be a much better option for you. Uh, medical oversight. So you'll be working with a medical provider. You cannot do an intrauterine insemination on your own, and you cannot do an intrauterine insemination in your home. So if you have a history of early miscarriage, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, hyper or hypothyroid, you have low fertility or difficulty predicting ovulation, such as the OPKs are not working well for you, maybe even if you have irregular cycles. So maybe your cycles range from 23 days to 35 days, having medical oversight can be beneficial for you. Additionally, ultrasounds to watch the follicle growth. So if you were to come into us, we have the option of using ultrasounds to make sure you grow a follicle, and then we would watch that follicle grow. Uh, medications to ensure that you ovulate. Women do not ovulate every cycle, um, even if their LH test tells them there's a positive. So we're able to get around those difficulties uh, and pot potentially prevent early pregnancy loss. Intrauterine insemination, you will need medical clearance. So for you to come to our clinic, we require medical clearance from your primary care, your OBGYN. And then if you have a comorbidity, we ask that you check with your specialist. It's really going in and saying, hey doc, is it okay if I get pregnant when my sugar level is this high? Or is it okay getting pregnant when my thyroid is acting this way? Um, we'll have you do some very basic labs. Uh, we'll have you check for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, gonorrhea, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, what we can do a fertility, dis fertility assessment in office, and we can actually do the labs in office for you. So it depends on your provider and who you go to. Um, other recommendations for medical clearance would be having a normal pap smear, normal thyroid, um, being without anemia or any vitamin deficiencies. Next, let's see, Fairfax to ship sperm vials directly to your clinic. So if you're worried at all about the shipping, um, being available to get the tank, uh, we can actually have it shipped directly to your clinic where their lab, if they have a lab, can prep the vial for you. So it takes out a little bit of that guesswork. Optional, uh, ovulation predictor kits, it depends on where you are with your fertility and with your health, uh, whether or not OPKs are working for you. Uh, we can also provide fertility medications. Your doctor may want to put you on Clomid or Letrozole to ensure follicle growth. And then ultrasounds, like I said, we watch the follicle grow. So we make sure that when we're inseminating that there's a follicle in your ovary ready to come out with ovulation. Uh, intrauterine insemination process. So I wanted to show you the tools. We use a speculum. This goes into the vaginal canal. This is exactly what is used when you have your pap smear. Um, you can see that it opens up so that it can view the cervix at the end of the vaginal canal. This is our catheter. It's the needleless syringe that we talked about with the in-home insemination, except instead of being attached to a needle, it's attached to this little straw, or we call it a catheter. So this will go into the, into the vaginal canal through the cervix, and then the sperm will be deposited into the uterus. And we'll have you relax with tilted pelvis for 15 minutes. The cost is, of course, the sperm vial, uh, any ovulation predictor kits you may need, or ultrasounds, medications, assessments, and then the IUI procedure itself. There's a cost to pay the provider for doing the insemination, as well as the clinic. Uh, there is a 20% success rate with IUI as compared to a roughly 10% success rate with ICI in in-home insemination. Um, increased rates, ultrasounds, meds, decreased rates, age, comorbidities. What do we have? Uh, this is our uh, age per month chance of conception. So it lets you know that starting about age 30, 31, where fertility will naturally decline. That is a normal process, and we expect it to be much lower by the time you hit um, 35 or 40. So again, check with your doctor about your fertility. 
And then this is a beautiful picture of a couple. Uh, our clinic is located at 65 North Madison Avenue, Suite 610 in Pasadena, California. If you're in the area and you would like to seek services from us, please uh, give us a call or check out our website at packrepro.com. Okay, are you going to um, switch back over to me now? Yes. I'm sorry, how do I? I got it. Okay. <laughs> I, I did it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to open up the Q&A. Let me get to that slide. Here we go. But before we start the Q&A, we want to offer you some savings. If you use the co promo code HOME in SEM webinar, you can save $149 on the full unlimited access package, which is a great way to really dive in and get started in searching for your donor. It gives you access to all of the different products that we offer for the donors. So I'm gonna invite Christy Burke, our Director of Client Services, to join us. She'll be on audio. And then Morgan, if um, you could start peppering us with questions. Kate and I Great. and Christy are ready. So we have a lot of great questions already. Just a reminder, if anyone wants to submit their question for the team, they can put it into the panel on the GoToWebinar uh, questions bar. So let's just start here at the top. Uh, how much is the art vial? Art vial prices will vary along with all of our other um, categories and donors based on um, if the donor is an open donor or an, an excuse me an ID donor or a non ID donor so what we would recommend is to use the search feature um, when you click on the donor that you're interested in in the bottom right hand corner you'll see what's available in regards to prep type and how much it, it costs um, usually an art vial though in general is about one half price of a of a standard IUI or ICI vial and our art vials are actually sold in pairs which is great too Okay, here's another question. How often do vials become available for a specific donor after they sell out? So I can answer that one. Um, it, it's gonna depend on the donor. We try to build up enough vials in our inventory so that we can provide a, enough sperm for um, the recipients up to 25 families in the United States. If the donor sells out, he may be releasing more inventory, he may not be. So um, we do the testing on the donors periodically every 90 days to clear additional units from quarantine. Every vial that's produced has to be held in quarantine for up to six, for, for at least six months. So once it reaches that point, every 90 days we're doing additional draws to um, release additional inventory for sale. That being said, it's never guaranteed that additional inventory will clear. Um, it does require that additional testing, and sometimes a donor may have met um, the family limit, and if that's the case, will be indicated as a sibling-only donor. Great. All right, here's another one. Is the sperm still viable when it's thawed and used for an IUI procedure, even though they might not use the whole vial? Can it be refrozen and the sperm still be viable? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, we do not recommend multiple freeze-thaw cycles. As you can imagine, um, being cryopreserved, being frozen to that temperature is not an easy process for any cell to go through. Um, ice crystals form, cell membranes can break. So every time the sample is frozen and thawed, you're losing more viable cells. So we don't recommend a repeat freeze thaw. Um, I know there are some clinics, especially if you're doing an IVF or ICSI procedure that will do, they call it a chipping technique where they don't actually thaw the vial, they sort of chip away at the frozen sample and just saw the little bit that comes off um, so that they're not compromising the quality. Um, but Kate, is there ever an instance where you would do that, where you would thaw and then refreeze and thaw again? No, we use the entire vial. The yeah. vials are sort of exactly frozen to the right amount. So we've never had to waste any of the vial and we never would. If we get a count that's over 10 million, and it ends up being, I don't know, 11 million, 14 million, even 15. 
we'll inseminate with that. That's right. Yeah. Great. Uh, I have a series of questions here for Kate. Uh, for ICI at home, does having a tilted uterus change the procedure in any way? Very unlikely that it will change the procedure in any way. Um, make sure that you're doing your flipping so that every time you flip, that sperm will wash over the cervix. Mm -hmm. um, tilted uterus, most women have tilted uteruses or tilted cervix. It's really not an issue. I, um, I know providers tend to tell their patients these details, but it, it doesn't really doesn't matter. And here's another one that's related. When you are turning you when you are turning from your back to the stomach, the syringe should be removed, correct? Also, yes. you take out the syringe right away or should it uh, sit with you within it for 30 minutes? I got excited, but yes, no, you can take the syringe out right away. So once you've deposited the sperm, you can remove the syringe and it does not need to be inside when you're doing your flipping and it does not need to remain in there for 30 minutes after, nothing like that. Once the sperm is out, it's out. You can actually, if you notice that there's a little bit trapped in there, you can always pull the plunger back and then just push a little air into the vagina and it'll get out that last little bit. I mean, that's what I would do. It's very, very precious and each little drop has, I don't know, a million sperm in it. So might as well get that last little drop, but then you can remove the syringe. And another two-parter for you, Kate, does it have to be warm and isn't it more of a chance during a woman's climax? Yes, uh, does the sperm have to be warm? No, the sperm needs to be room temperature, which is what will happen when you defrost it for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you don't want the sperm to be frozen necessarily, so that's why we ask you to invert it. You'll be able to see if it falls at in one big clump or if it is a thick liquid. So no, you don't need to warm it. You just need it to be room temp. And then yes, uh, through climax, through a uh, female orgasm, it encourages the sperm to go into the cervix, into the uterus and um, essentially inseminate or to uh, fertilize the egg. So yeah, uh, that's something that you can do afterwards. I would recommend not doing anything penetrative or putting anything in the vagina uh, because you want to protect that sperm and you want to give it time to get into the uterus. Treat it as if it's very fragile and you don't want to um, kill any of it. Okay, here's another question. I had two IUI and two IVF, but nothing worked. Is at this situation, what works best for me, ICI or IUI? So you've had how many IVF? Two IUI and two IVF, but nothing worked. I think this is a great question for the provider that did the IVF. Um, so the providers that do IVFs are reproductive endocrinologists. An endocrinologist is someone that specialize in, specializes in hormones. A reproductive endocrinologist specializes in reproductive hormone. So it would be good to figure out why it's not working. Um, on the grand scheme of things, you have IUI as usually a first step, then uh, I, I'm sorry, ICI as a first step, intracervical insemination or in-home insemination. If that's not an option, then we have you go up to IUI. After IUI, then we do IVF. So IVF is the top top that you can do, and the results are often uh, quite, success rates are quite better. Um, so I would talk to the reproductive endocrinologist that did the IVF and ask them what they think is going on. It sounds like maybe IUI, ICI is not quite right for you. Someone wants to know why IUI can't be done at home. Yes, why an IUI can't be done at home. Um, Michelle, would you be able to get back to that picture of the anatomy of the female body and it shows Absolutely. IUI? Okay, so the vaginal canal is kind of unique in that it is inside the body, but it's also considered outside of the body. Think like your mouth, right? So it's inside the body, but it's also outside the body. You can deposit sperm with an in-home insemination in the vaginal canal, that's absolutely fine. You're not going to have um, infection, you're not going to have a lot of difficulties with that. 
Uh, but when we do the intrauterine insemination, we're actually going inside the body. So we're going into an organ of the body and we need to use sterile equipment. So we cannot, um, we cannot use, how do I want to put this? It, it's something that a medical provider has been trained for and they're trained in certain techniques. Uh, we would not want you to do that at home. We also have use for a, a speculum when we're doing an ICI. And the speculum is something that a provider should use. So uh, just to reiterate, it is, it is a process or a procedure where you actually go inside the uterus and you need a medical provider to do that to uh, hopefully avoid any complications or God forbid, an intrauterine infection. Yeah, I was just gonna add that you don't necessarily wanna take the risk of trying to do that at home because inserting the catheter. You don't want to scrape the side of the uterine wall. You don't want to risk a tear. You don't want to cause severe cramping, which is uh, is going to, you know, be contraindicated for trying to, to uh, um, you know, fertilize the egg. Um, you don't want to risk infection. It really should be done in a sterile environment in the hands of a medical provider who's been trained. Someone wants to know, uh, speaking of IUIs, is IUI uncomfortable or painful? Do you have any recommendations for making it a more pleasant experience? Yes, so I love this question. <laughs> IUIs are, for most patients, I'd say nine out of 10, not uncomfortable. It, it's about uh, as uncomfortable as a pap smear. Um, it's momentary, it ends. Sometimes there's cramping afterwards, but it's usually pretty minimal. So uh, I really enjoy telling patients that it's not an incredibly painful, painful procedure. Um, it's usually something that you can handle. You can even go back to work right afterwards if you'd like. Uh, it sort of depends on how you respond to it. But yes, most women don't find it to be super painful in any way. We're not cutting any tissue. We're not stitching anything up. We're not rearranging anything. We're simply going in, depositing the sperm, and then coming back out again. Um, sometimes I might see one or two drops of blood. Um, so you might see that when you wipe later. But really, there shouldn't be active bleeding. There shouldn't be a lot of pain. Oh, and then uh, recommendations. Usually the most difficulty that our women have is with the speculum, which is just a horrible instrument. But once you put it into the vaginal canal, if you can do some deep breathing, that will relax your pelvic muscles. You're not gonna feel your pelvic muscles relaxing, but I promise it is, and it's easier to maneuver the speculum. But that's usually, again, nine out of 10 women, it's in there for under five minutes, and then we're done. It takes about as long as it takes to get a pap smear to do an IUI. Christy, I've got a couple of questions for you next. The first one here is, what is on the home and sem form that my doctor has to sign for me to complete a home insemination? Sure, yep, it's a basic, it's a very straightforward form. It's not a lot of um, information that the clinic will have to complete. Um, it's one page and basically they're just going to list your information, including your name, um, what address that you want the specimen to be shipped to. And then they're also obviously gonna sign off that they're agreeing to allow you to ship to your home. And they'll also put a date on the form, which would be for how long we're able to ship. Um, how long is totally up to you on the clinic. You can decide that. Um, I've seen some clinics will just do it for one month. I've seen some clinics offer it for a year. So that's something you'd want to talk um, to your clinic directly. Um, but if that's the way that you'd like to go, please reach out to our CS team by phone and we can work with you to get that sent over to your clinic so they can fill that out. Great. And Christy, another question for you. We've got a bunch of people here who are sending in questions about being located in Canada um, and want to know if they're able to do home insemination as well. How do they figure that out? Shipping to a home in Canada, I'm not 100% sure on that. I think that you would really need to reach out to the distributor that you're working with currently. We work with two, um, Can-Am Cryo and ReproMed. Um, their information is, is on our website, specifically our Canadian site right at the top of the search. And you could reach out to them for more information on that. Uh, and do we ship to the UK? Yes, um, we, we can ship to the UK, but only direct to a clinic, not to a home address. 
Uh, and another question for you, how long should I expect to be on the wait list for my donor? That's a wonderful question, but unfortunately I don't have an exact time frame that I can give. It will depend on a lot of different factors. It will depend on the specific donor, if they're still active in the program with us um, or not, if they have vials pending release or not. Um, so what I would recommend is to reach out to our CS team with your specific donor and we can look into it for you a bit and try to give you a little bit of a better idea of how long it might be. Great, thanks Christy. So I sure. think this one may be for Michelle. Um, one of my most important questions is about genetic testing. The donors from Fairfax sometimes has a test for some genetic mutations and others for others. Why are some donors cost more than others? Well, the cost doesn't have anything to do with the genetic testing. Um, we did do a an expanded carrier screening webinar a couple of months ago that is available on our website and our one of our genetic counselors, Suzanne Seitz, does a wonderful overview of that whole process and explains everything. We have been doing the expanded carrier screen, which is a, a screening panel for over 280 recessive disorders uh, for the last couple of years on our donors. If the donor is a carrier, in order for you to purchase, you have to complete a consent that acknowledges that you yourself are not a carrier for the same condition, because as I mentioned, these are recessive um, disorders, and it would take two mutated copies in order to have an affected child. So by doing this um, consent, you're acknowledging that you are not a carrier, even if the donor is. Uh, the, the flip side of that is if you know and it's been identified that you yourself are a carrier for a genetic condition and you want to search the web and the donor search for a donor who's been tested for that and is negative, you have the ability to do that. Um, and it, we also will offer special testing in some circumstances if we don't happen to have that testing completed on the donor. Um, the, and, and just that last bit, um, the pricing doesn't vary based on um, expanded carrier panel. It, the pricing will depend on preparation type and donor type. Um, the ID release or ID option donors are a bit more expensive and the IUI vials are more expensive because of the additional processing steps that go into preparing them for purchase. Great. Can I, can I just say something really quick? Um, mm -hmm. Genetic testing is still relatively new and genetics as a science is still relatively new. So a lot of our patients don't know much about genetics and how to maneuver that. So you can absolutely ask questions of client services and you can talk to your own provider about that. Um, they should be able to help you maneuver that. No one expects you to know all of it. Um, and it can be um, a little disconcerting when you find a donor that you like and they are positive for a genetic test. But with testing for hundreds of genetic tests, it's likely that they're going to come up with at least one. So um, continue to ask questions and, and ask uh, your medical provider for assistance. Yeah, and, and recognize we're literally every one of us is a carrier for something. Um, we just don't know it. And not everything has been um, able to be tested for at this point. So it, it is very important, as Kate said, to ask questions. And like I said, we have that great webinar and there's really good informational um, pages on our website about the genetic testing and what the results mean and what any risk, you know, residual risk may be. Great. Um, okay, for home ICI, can we store the sperm vials at home or do they need to be stored at a medical clinic? If we can store at home, what's the best way to do so? So the short answer is no, you can't store the sperm at home. When samples are cryopreserved, what that means is they're being maintained uh, at a temperature of minus 196 degrees to minus 150 degrees. If they get any warmer, they'll start to thaw and you'll have metabolic activity, which means that the cells are metabolizing what's going on around them, using up nutrients in the media and will die off over time. Um, a regular freezer is not sufficient. Minus 80 is not even sufficient. Um, so if you're going to do home insemination, you want to time your home delivery for the day before or the day of. The tank that you will receive that is holding the sample will, will, will maintain that temperature for several days. Um, but like I said, ideally, if you wanted to do your insemination on Wednesday, you're going to try to get that tank to your house by Tuesday. Um, and not remove the sample until right before you're going to use it. Um, so you're not storing at home, it stays in the tank 
The other alternative we can offer is if you happen to be local to one of our six locations, um, and you can see the different locations on our website, if you happen to be local to one of our locations, you can ship to our location and pick up from one of our labs. So for example, if you have the means to perhaps purchase six vials because you know that you want to have, you know, you know it may take multiple insemination attempts and you may want to have um, full siblings for your child, you can purchase six vials, ship, for example, to the Philadelphia location, um, and then just pick up what you need. That way you're only paying shipping one time and then there's a, sh a, sh a small handling fee each time you want to pick up. That way you don't have to worry about getting things delivered um, close to the day that you need to do your insub. And what can we do with the tank once uh, we use the sperm? So the tank needs to be returned. And if you did a pickup, you need to bring it back to the clinic, um, to our location. And if you had it shipped, it needs to be shipped back right away. We need those tanks. Um, in order to keep shipping out additional samples to additional recipients and clinics. So I would say that if you use your vial on Tuesday, send it back to us Tuesday. And there is, when you receive it, if it's shipped to your home, you'll see that in the um, in the paperwork packet, there is a return label and you'll just have to call FedEx and schedule the pickup or take it to a FedEx location. But we need you to return it the day that you use it. Great. And Michelle, here's another one for you. Does the ID donor mean that the age of 18, the child may be able to contact a donor if the donor chooses? Correct. So our ID program um, works just very similarly to how that's described. What will happen is when your child is 18, so when they're an adult, technically, um, they can contact the cryobank and make a request for the donor's contact information. At that point, we're going to reach out to the donors just as a courtesy, find out if there's a preferred method of contact, one that works best for them. And then we're gonna take that information and release it to your child. They then can um, go ahead and contact the donor either by the preferred method or if he didn't indicate a preferred method, however your child prefers. Um, but basically our ID program is such that we will give that information to the child only not to a recipient. And we don't mediate that contact. We, we, we give the information and it's up to your child when they're comfortable and ready and they feel like they want that connection. Um, and then it's up to the donor to respond. Great. Um, and some people wanna know what is the difference between ICI and ICI art? Can both be done at home? Yeah, so the, that's just about the prep type. It's not the procedure. So ICI is going to have at least 10 million total modal cells and ICI art file is gonna have at least 6 million total, total modal cells. So if you're gonna do a home insemination, you're either gonna use one ICI vial or two IUI art files. Okay. And someone wants to know, Michelle, can you say more about why the sample is in quarantine for six months? That's just a, a, a regulatory requirement. The FDA or Food and Drug Administration um, regulates donor gametes, egg and sperm. And the um, in May 25th, 2005, everyone in our industry knows that date. That's when FDA's uh, regulations were put into place. And basically they required that time period because they want the testing upfront when the sample's collected but what they wanted to do at that time when they established these regula regulations was to ensure that testing is done after the fact to ensure that the samples are in, in fact safe. Now, we're talking about 15 years ago when technology was not what it is now and testing, testing uh, methodology is not what it is now. Technically, it doesn't need to be a six month quarantine. We have the, the um, technological advances to detect all of those infectious diseases in a much shorter period, but um, the FDA has not updated their regulatory requirements yet. Um, the hope is that they will at some point based on tech testing technologies, but they haven't. Um, it really came out of uh, the, the detection of HIV um, initially, HIV detection rates were not as good as what they are now in the test um, in the test kits that were available. And now, as you all are aware, there's rapid testing. There's there's so many very good um, mechanisms to do that testing. And as I said, FDA just hasn't updated their their standards. So we have the upfront testing, and then we have to have that post quarantine six month testing to ensure that the donor is still negative for all of the infectious diseases to release those samples from quarantine. Great. 
Are all donors tested for HPV? It, only at our cryobank. So uh, Fairfax Cryobank does the HPV 16 and 18 testing. We do, um, we're specifically looking at the, the variants 16 and 18 because those are causative, potential causative factors in cervical cancer. We are the only sperm bank that's doing that. The way that we do that testing is a small uh, volume of the semen sample is pulled aside for testing and DNA, that, that NAT PCR testing is done to detect um, the 16 and 18 strain. Great. Uh, we're getting a couple of questions regarding CMV. Someone wants to know, can you briefly explain positive, negative CMV for donor and client? Sure. So I'll take the donor side if you want to take the client side. Um, for the donors, part of the infectious disease screening panel is looking at um, CMV total antibodies. CMV is a very common virus. Cytomegalovirus is all over the place. Uh, depending on um, your ethnic background, up to 65% of the population is exposed and has had a CMV infection at some time. The majority of us will not know you will be asymptomatic. You will have no idea that you've been exposed. When a donor is indicated as a CMV positive donor on the website, it just means that he is total antibody or IgG positive. What that means is he has had exposure to CMV in the past and he has antibodies protecting him circulating in his immune system and in his bloodstream. It does not mean that he is infectious for CMV. We actually do two tests. Um, we do an IgM, which is another kind of antibody. So that will detect if there is shedding active infection. If a donor is IgM positive for CMV, the sample collected on the day of that blood draw is discarded. And we do uh, the DNA PCR NAT testing on the semen sample, on the actual semen, and that's detecting active virus as well. If that's positive, we're able to back test specimen dates and get rid of anything that was affected. Um, so whether a donor is CMV positive or negative on our catalog, you are not ever going to get a sample that has active virus in it. We will discard and get rid of all of the active, all of the samples um, collected during an active viral infection. Um, that being said, in my experience, most of the providers that we work with um, will tell an individual recipient to purchase a donor that has the same CMV status that they do. That being said, all of our samples are um, safe. So Kate, do you have any recommendations in terms of recipients and CMV status? Yeah, so you said it all. <laughs> um, so we, uh, obstetricians and gynecologists, we're, we have a governing body called ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and they, um, they figure out what we should do and what we should recommend to our patients. So CMV testing before pregnancy and during pregnancy is technically not even recommended. So if you're buying donor sperm and, and you're concerned about CMV, it's important to know if you have been exposed to CMV, if, if, that's, if that's even relevant to you. Um, if you test positive for CMV and you have an active CMV infection, uh, Michelle was talking about IgG, if you have IgG, then you don't want to get pregnant. There can be some serious side effects or, or consequences with that. But as far as donor sperm goes, the only donor sperm that you're able to buy is donor sperm that was once exposed to CMV. So all we have is antibodies in that sperm. We don't have the actual virus in the sperm. We just have antibodies. You cannot get CMV from antibodies. So it's just saying that you were once, that that person was once exposed. Um, but it also matters whether or not you've been exposed to CMV. If you're really concerned about CMV and you wanna get tested for CMV, you can ask your provider, your primary care provider, or your OBGYN, say, I wanna get tested for CMV. It's likely affordable. It may not be covered by an insurance, right. but um, it's worth looking into. Uh, like Michelle said, most people have been exposed to CMV at some point in their life. By the time, I think the statistics are 50 to 80% of people before the age of 40 are exposed to CMV. And so most of those people have antibodies. Um, so it, you, you may not know if you've had CMV yourself. You may not have had 
the flu or the cold-like symptoms that can come with CMV. Sometimes you're exposed and then it's just kind of your body fights it off. Your, most people, their body is strong enough to fight off CMV, but when you're pregnant, that's when you worry about risks to the fetus. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and just, just make sure you understand if you are asking to be tested for CMV, if you get a total antibody result, that doesn't tell you if you're currently infected. That's just telling you that you, you're either infected now or you had a past exposure. If you wanna know if you have a current infection, you wanna get that breakdown of the IgG and IgM. If IgM is positive, you have an active infection. IgG is positive, it's a past infection. If both, you know, if both are positive, you're actively infected. Great. All right, switching gears a little bit, going back to Christy. For a couple trying to get pregnant for the first time, how many vials would you recommend purchasing? Great question. Um, usually we will recommend that you discuss that with your provider, but on average, our clients are purchasing between one and two vials per procedure. That's what we see most often. Okay. And then we also have some questions for you, Christy, about the vial buyback program. Uh, can you explain that a little bit, what that is? Sure, yeah. So um, Michelle talked about it a little bit earlier, but if you purchase vials with us and you're not ready to use them quite yet, you can store them here with us um, as long as needed. Um, we're actually running a great savings offer right now. Any storage purchase is three months of storage for free the first three months. If the vials are stored here and they never ship out, so they never leave one of our facilities, you would always have the option to return them back to us excuse me, return them back to us for 50% of the original purchase price. And there's no time frame on that, so it could be next year or 10 years from now. The uh, only a stipulation is that they don't ship out. Um, if and when you're ready to do that, to do that return, you can reach out to our CS team and we'll uh, send a form for you to complete. And then once we get that form back, we'll start the process. Okay, great. Uh, we are at, uh, just a quick note, we are at three o'clock. We're going to go for a couple more minutes of questions. Um, we do have some great resources on our website, Frequently Asked Questions. We've done blog posts of questions that have come up in several of our um, webinars in the past, so you can always go back to those resources. But we do have some more time for some questions today. Great. Uh, here's a two-parter for Christy. Uh, the donor I'm interested in has over 50 vials. How fast can the vial sell? And can you give me an estimate based on the prior donor purchases? Also, when do they become sibling only? Okay, um, so in regards to over 50, yes, that's a great number. It's a, that's a higher number, but I'll always tell every client that I speak to that we can never guarantee availability for any donor at any time, unfortunately. <laughs> so even if there's 50 plus, I could see that happen. That could sell in a month. It could sell in a week. It could sell in a year. There's no way to know. So if you really like the donor, I always recommend purchase sooner rather than later, which is why we have that great storage um, option for you. That way you can, you know, be 100% sure that you have the vials when you need it. And then Morgan, can you refresh my memory on the rest of the question? <laughs> sure. And then they were also asking um, when it becomes sibling only. At what point? Ah, okay. I can take that if you want. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so we have made the decision to stop distribution when we have 25 families reported in the United States to make the donor sibling only. So we rely really heavily on you all, the recipients, to report your births and pregnancies to us so that we can track that accurately. So at 25 families, we stop distributing to new clients. If you've reported a pregnancy or birth with us, um, and it is important to report the live birth, um, we will then be able to sell additional vials to you because it would be for a sibling pregnancy. The regulations for international areas vary. So for example, the UK has a limit of 10. There are various states in Australia that have five or 10. Um, you know, depending where the sperm is going, we are going to follow the regulation of that jurisdiction in terms of family limits. Uh, okay, and then here's one for you, Michelle. Why do some donors have IUI vials but not have ICI vials available? Is it based on how you guys prep the sperm to determine which type it will be? Right, so every time a donor comes in to produce a sample, we do a fresh evaluation. And in order to get uh, enough sperm per vial to do an ICI, which is not washed, 
Um, it has to have a certain count and volume and motility combination. Um, and the same for IUI. It really depends on what the fresh sample is. And it also depends on how well the sample freezes. So some men, their samples freeze really well if you wash them and the IUIs have great survivability. But if you don't wash that seminal fluid out and you're only adding the freeze media, it doesn't survive as well. So what we're doing in the lab is we're optimizing the survivability of a sample it, by determining how best to process and freeze it. So there are some donors who will not produce let's say an ICI vial, the, the, the combination just doesn't work of all of the different parameters, or he just doesn't freeze and survive the thaw as well without that wash. And that is not an indicator in any way of the health of the sample. It just varies donor to donor. If, if you all could imagine everything that we do to our bodies, everything we're experiencing, everything we're breathing in, drinking in, it all affects our physiology, which affects our reproduction. And so with sperm donors, literally something they do today can affect a sample tomorrow or three months from now. So we're really monitoring and working with our donors to optimize their, their sample production to get good counts, good motility, for them to stay healthy, even just a change in diet makes a huge difference. A change in exercise routine makes a huge difference. So we monitor all of that and work with the guys so that we can get the best samples possible. Um, you know, so I, that's sort of a long answer to a simple question, <laughs> but um, it's about optimizing the survivability of the sample so that you get the most sperm swimming ready to fertilize that egg. Kate, here's a question for you. How soon after IUI do you take a pregnancy test? Yeah, <laughs> so there are tests that can check within five days, supposedly. Um, I think seven days is a little more accurate and in, I think two weeks is going to be your definitive test. So yes, you can, I would say test up to seven days after, um, but two weeks, is your definitive. After two weeks, you should be getting your period. And another one for you, Kate, any benefit to doing a double home insemination back to back? Uh, a double home insemination back to back. So I'm not, there's some details to that question that I would need to know. Um, you so Kate, what about doing two, two vials mm -hmm. in one cycle? Two is vials in one cycle yeah. for in-home insemination is okay. So if you wanted to split it up time-wise, you need to know what your fertility period is. So if you're ovulating for about 24 hours, you need to have a good understanding of when you're fertile. Um, it, the sperm is only going to live for about 24 hours, so you need to get it within that 24-hour period. You can do it all at once if you want, but there's really no recommendations that you need more than 10 million sperm. So if you really want to maximize uh, financially, I would say if you were insistent on doing two, you'd want to do them at different times um, because that sperm is going to live inside the body only for 24 hours and only within that 24 hour ovulation window. So essentially, no, there, there's no um, benefit to doing two, but if you're dead set on doing it, I would switch up the time so that it's, you know, at the beginning of the 24 hour period. And then again, at towards the end of the 24 hour period. But 10 is million better? is what studies show us are all that's needed to get pregnant. Is it better to use two ART versus one ICI regular? No, there's no, there is no real benefit to that. It's just, um, it's just about what's available. Um, okay, let's see. I recently purchased a IUI art vial. However, my donor only had one vial available. Will this be enough to conceive? If it's an IUI art vial, you're only gonna have about 6 million total modal. It is technically enough to, to, to conceive, but I would recommend using that for an in-office IUI. If not going to IVF, it's gonna depend on what your provider's recommendation for you is. I don't know, you know, it's gonna depend on what your fertility looks like. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And then here's another question. I'm going in for a well woman exam. Is there anything special I should ask my provider to get started? 
Yay, I love it. So yeah, tell your provider that you want to get pregnant. What can you do? What can you check? Um, if you're over the age of 35, ask them to check your fertility. Um, they can do a full hormone panel if they feel like they're knowledgeable enough to interpret that panel, or they can do a test that we like to do at our clinic. It's, it's called anti-malarian hormone, anti-malarian hormone. It's AMH. Uh, your primary care provider might not know what it is, but usually they can look it up for you, or your OBGYN will know exactly what it is, and they can determine what your fertility looks like. If you have low fertility, then we start to worry about egg quality. You might want to get a referral to a reproductive endocrinologist. Um, if you have history of fibroids or you have a history of um, maybe your thyroid lab values kind of being on the line or a uh, family history of thyroid issues, if you have any history of comorbidities, make sure you talk to the doctor as that relates to pregnancy. You want their interpretation on your health and how that is going to translate during pregnancy or trying to conceive. And that will give you a good idea of what procedure to do, um, how many tries you're going to need, how many vials you need. It'll, it'll give you a nice prep. Um, they'll probably want to do a pap smear. If you're due for a mammogram, definitely get that mammogram first um, and try to get that preconception visit out of the way before you start trying. All right. And if we know our ovulation date, how soon should we place the order for shipping? Christy? Yes. Um, well, you can, it's really up to you in regards to when you want to ship, but I always say sooner is a little bit better than later. Um, our tanks are good for seven days from the day they ship out to give you a little bit of a window there. Um, you can also request a 14 day tank as well, give you an, an extra week. Um, a lot of our clients shipping to their home really appreciate those because they're always not 100% sure when they're going to actually ovulate and it gives them a little bit more peace of mind. Uh, but if you're in the continental U.S., shipping time is usually between one and two business days. So we can get it to you pretty quickly. Um, just keep in mind that FedEx is normally just delivering Monday through Friday. So you want to keep you know, those weekends um, in mind. Uh, we can do some Saturday deliveries, but they're not guaranteed everywhere. So I don't like our clients to um, depend on those. But you can definitely contact CS and we can give you a better idea of if you need like a weekend delivery if that's available to your area. Can IUI vials be shipped to a home address? Yes, we, we can ship any preparation type to your home address as long as we have all the appropriate paperwork on file. Great. And uh, I think we've got time for one more question here. Can my regular GP perform an IUI in her office or does it need to be at a fertility clinic? Yeah, it's typically done at a fertility clinic. Um, you're welcome to ask, but it's unlikely that they'll be able to do that for you. Um, years ago, I worked with an OBGYN where we did fertility treatments within the office. So some OBGYNs do specialize in fertility as well, um, but it's unlikely that your primary care provider will do that. And they, they certainly wouldn't be able to wash a sample for you if you needed it, because they're not gonna have the equipment to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are we good? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for participating today for your great questions. We really appreciate it. Um, the uh, promo code, forgot the word, the promo code is valid through the end of the month. So go ahead and use that if you're getting started on your journey to finding a sperm donor. And this webinar recording will be emailed out to all of, all of the attendees. So thank you all. Thank you to the speakers and Chrissy and Morgan. Thank you for being there. Um, have you. a good rest of your day. Stay safe.